હવે અવાજ નહીં આ કે હાય વેરી ગુડ મોર્નિંગ આઈ એમ ડોક્ટર જનક પટેલ એમ ડી જનરલ ફિઝિશિયન ઓલ માય વિડીયો લેક્ચર્સ આર મેનલી ફોર એજ્યુકેટિવ પર્પઝ ઇન કન્ટિન્યુટી ધ પ્રીવિયસ લેક્ચર્સ ઇન ન્યુરોલોજી ટુડે વિલ બી ડિસ્કસિંગ ઓન પેરાપ્લેજિયા દેટ ઇઝ મોટર વીકનેસ ઇન બોથ લોવર લિપ્સ દેટ ઇઝ કોલ પેરાપ્લેજિયા very frequently this topic we can be asked as a full question a case can be given to you in your exams as well as in oral exam good number of thing can be asked from this topic at the same time you will see once in a while in your everyday practice the person will come to you with weakness in both lower limbs so this is a useful topic so do pay attention and go through so para plegia means motor weakness when you say plegia it is a full motor weakness or total motor weakness and para means both lower limb so when there is a weakness in both lower limb and it is a full motor weakness we call that is a paraplegia and when there is a partial weakness we call as a paraparesis and this will be very commonly disorders you will see in a children it is more common than in adults some of the paraplegic disorders are very very common in children as compared to adults so paraplegia is an impair impairment of motor dysfunction in both lower extremity it may be with sensory or without sensory it will be due to two common mechanism one either because of the damage to the brain that is cerebral paraplegia or because of damage to the spinal cord that we call as spinal paraplegia so there will be two groups either damage to the cerebral cortex or to brain and second common damage to spinal cord this will be the two common conditions and again in a spinal cord it has to be below t2 and above l1 that is between t2 to 12 t12 segments in spinal cord it will result into paraplegia so the paraplegia dense paralysis of both lower limb that is it is coming from a greek greek word para means strikes at sight there is an impairment of the motor function in both lower extremity may be with sensory or without sensory involvement when you use plegia means complete paralysis paresis means partial so when we use a para paresis means it is a partial weakness there is one word called as a quadriplegia when there is an involvement of all the four extremities but if two lower extremities are more involved as compared to upper extremities then the word utilized is diplegia so it is a common finding which you can come across in cerebral palsy where two lower limbs may be more involved as compared to two upper limbs then it is used cerebral diplegia there are few words which will be very frequently being utilized in this paraplegic chapter one depending upon the onset sudden onset or acute onset second gradual or chronic there will be few conditions which will be with acute onset there will be few condition where you will have a gradual or chronic onset depending upon the type of motor involvement if it is lower motor neuron involvement it will be flaccid if it is a upper motor involvement it will be spastic and again in upper motor neuron involvement depending upon the type of a damage you will have 
paraplegia in flexion, paraplegia in extension. Also, you will get a flaccid variety in case of an acute spinal cord injury. So, any acute spinal cord insult will produce flaccid variety. It can be pure motor where there is no sensory involvement or it can be motor with sensory involvement with or without bladder involvement. So it can be it can be pure sensory with motor involvement or it can be pure motor. It can be partial damage or it can be total damage. It can be traumatic, it can be non-traumatic. And in a spinal cord, the most common word utilized is compressive, non-compressive. And by etiology wise, genetic or we call congenital or familial and second group is acquired group. And in acquired, we can use word traumatic, non-traumatic, compressive, non-compressive, partial, complete, motor, mixed variety, flaccid, spastic. Flaccid and spastic word will be utilized mainly in case of a motor. And in spastic, we further divide into inflection and in extension. And depending upon the onset, acute or chronic onset. These are all the word be, are being utilized. So if we go through, basically, there will be two big groups because of damage to cerebral hemisphere or because of damage to spinal cord. And if there is a damage to spinal cord, it can be divided into different groups that is acute or chronic, congenital or acquired, compressive, non-compressive, traumatic, non-traumatic, partial, complete, flaccid, spastic, pure motor or maybe mixed variety. So these are all the terms very frequently utilized. All these terms are mainly for spinal variety. And so it is basically divided into spastic and flaccid. And then spastic you can divide into brain, spinal cord. When flaccid will be spinal cord, nerve or myopathy. But by and large, myopathy is not commonly included in paraplegia. We'll be, we have to use a separate terminology. By and large, we don't use myopathic disorders in paraplegias. We will have to mention paraplegia due to muscular disorder or myoneural junction disorders, etc. Those type of words we will have to use. By and large, that is not frequently included in that group. In general, the etiology you can put together into infective variety like viral transverse myelitis. The second most common cause of Paraplegia is spinal cord injury, particularly fracture vertebra, stab injury, bullet injury, penetrating injury, etc. And among vascular, anterior spinal artery syndrome or dissecting, dissection of abdominal aortic aneurysm. These are some of the acute conditions. So, three common infection, trauma and vascular. This will be the three common conditions. We'll be mentioning a lot of the other causes, while good number of condition will be gradual. Gulen barre can be one of the variety, but it will be mainly involvement of peripheral nerves. So, but it does give rise to bilateral lower limb motor weakness, and that is Gulen barre syndrome. Poliomyelitis, motor neuron disease. Poliomyelitis, no doubt it may be acute. Motor neuron disease is usually gradual. While cord compression is always gradual, latherism is always gradual, conzo is also gradual, subacute combined degeneration is gradual, surfer myopathy, myelopathy is not very gradual but can be acute. Bilateral anterior cerebral artery involvement rare but can be acute onset. Amyotropic lateral sclerosis is always gradual. Superior sagittal sinus thrombosis is again gradual. Hereditary spastic paraplegia or familial paraplegia is gradual. Tropical spastic paraplegia is gradual. 
So you will have to think in terms which category it belongs to. But these are some of the common. But now if we put it properly, we can divide into cerebral variety and spinal variety. In cerebral, most common is superior sagittal sinus thrombosis or parasagittal para lesions like superior sagittal sinus thrombosis or meningiomas or arterial disease wise unpaired anterior cerebral artery infarction that can result into paraplegia while in case of a spinal the most common is transverse myelitis traumatic damage to the spinal cord we call spinal cord injury epidural abscess anterior spinal artery infarct tumor that is partial compression then it becomes a complete compression secondary metastasis abscess disc lesion granulomas latherism etc if we take upper motor neuron variety can involve cerebral as well as spinal while lower motor neuron will be always spinal and that will produce flaccid any lower motor neuron in spinal some of the common which can involve lower motor neuron like poliomyelitis motor neuron disease those will be lower motor neuron in motor neuron you can have lower motor with upper motor neuron while pure lower motor neuron poliomyelitis will be classical example of that will be going through some of those conditions as we pass through so in cerebral variety cerebral diplegia superior sagittal sinus thrombosis this is also called a cerebral palsy parasagittal meningiomas unpaired anterior cerebral artery thrombosis gunshot injury in the mid part of the brain internal hydrocephalus etc these are some of the condition which can produce cerebral paraplegia as far as spinal is concerned we can divide into compressive non compressive or we can divide into upper motor neuron lower motor neuron which we have already shown you in one slide it will be coming so that can be there compressive can be intramedullary extramedullary and extramedullary can be intradural extradural there are some of the causes say intradural meningioma neurofibroma and extradural can be pot spine metastasis epidural abscess fractures etc while intramedullary classical example gliomas syringomyelia will be very common hematomyelia will be another common and ependymoma these are rare conditions gliomas and ependymoma but syringomyelia and hematomyelia is the most common while non compressive groups will be motor neuron disease subacute combined degeneration multiple sclerosis vascular that is particularly anterior spinal artery thrombosis or hemorrhage or even dissection of abdominal aortic aneurysm latherism familial spastic paraplegia frederick's ataxia transverse myelitis all this will be non compressive variety of which some will be acute say like acute transverse myelitis then uh, even we can say vascular that is anterior spinal artery occlusion or dissection of abdominal aortic aneurysm will be acute onset while by and large all these are the motor neuron disease subacute combined degeneration multiple sclerosis latherism familial spastic frederick's ataxia will be usually gradual or chronic repeatedly i am mentioning that so will be putting some into acute some into chronic so parasagittal region traumatic vascular we have already mentioned inflammation very rare encephalitis or meningoencephalitis neoplastic parasagittal meningioma already and classical cerebral palsy and that is very very commonly seen in children so spastic is by and large very frequently in upper motor neuron variety only never in lower motor neuron variety because lower motor neuron will always produce flaccid and we already mentioned all this diplegia meningioma superior sagittal sinus thrombosis parasagittal meningiomas unpaired anterior cerebral artery thrombosis gunshot injury internal hydrocephalus we already mentioned you can see the damage is close to the superior sagittal sinus it can produce paraplegia and that will be spastic paraplegia in a brain stem syringomyelia but good number of time it will produce quadriplegia instead of paraplegia 
and it can in some of the cases may involve lower limb more as compared to upper limb by and large in a transverse myelitis it is an acute inflammation acute damage which can be idiopathic following some infections particularly viral infections in idiopathic mainly autoimmune mechanism post vaccination in autoimmune disease like sle sarcoidosis multiple sclerosis as a paraneoplastic groups and also as a vascular etiology thrombosis of a spinal artery this can be some of the causes which can result into acute transverse myelitis and that will be acute and flaccid in initial stage it will be flaccid later on as the tone recovers it will be spastic variety so you can divide into acute and gradual we have already mentioned all this flaccid and spastic spastic we can that is upper motor neuron you can divide into two inflection and in extension partial damage extension full blown damage flexion it can be pure motor or maybe with sensory we call mix partial damage complete damage traumatic non traumatic compressive non compressive etiology wise acquired congenital or genetic or familial and we divide into spinal and cerebral so cerebral can produce upper motor neuron variety it will never produce lower motor neuron variety and in upper motor neuron partial damage will produce in extension and in complete damage it will produce in flexion and that you will see more common in a spinal rather than in case of a cerebral variety among acute the most common we already mentioned among infection viral traumatic can be spinal injury or even injury to the cerebral cortex or cerebral hemisphere fracture vertebra among vascular anterior spinal artery occlusion or dissecting abdominal aortic aneurysm and as far as cerebral is concerned unpaired anterior cerebral artery occlusion so vascular traumatic and among peripheral nerves it will be gulen barre and that will be acute in onset so by and large in this acute in onset they will be always flaccid in the initial stage but if there is a lower motor neuron involvement later on it will become flaccid only but if it is an upper motor neuron involvement in acute stage it will be flaccid but in a recovery stage it will be spastic particularly say in a case of a traumatic injury compressive pathology etc chronic is always spastic and some of the classical which always present as a chronic we have mentioned good number of cord compression will be always chronic motor neuron disease subacute combined degeneration lathyrism we have mentioned good number of condition initially also so now we are putting some of the common which you see in your everyday practice flaccid you will see in a uh, acute episode where you get a upper motor neuron lesion but person is in a spinal shock or neuronal shock during that stage the person will have a flaccid recovery stage will be spastic while in a lower motor neuron disease like poliomyelitis motor neuron disease tic paralysis peripheral nerve damage like gulen barre laid or chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy will be also lower motor neuron variety myoneural junction myasthenia gravis muscle proximal myopathy and you can have a periodic paralysis like hypokalemia and hyperkalemia this will be all producing lower motor neuron type of paralysis but this myoneural junction muscle periodic paralysis you will have to differentiate from spinal cord damage and peripheral nerve damage you will have to differentiate that because in this particular condition that is myoneural junction muscles and periodic paralysis peripheral nerve findings that is no conduction study will be normal and 
you will be finding out muscle involvement either by biopsy or EMG. That will be the peculiar in case of and you will have an absence of sensory symptoms which will be not seen in myoneural junction, muscular disorders and periodic paralysis. That should be kept in mind for ever. There are big list of acute flaccid paralysis. This is some of the conditions. There is a big list in peripheral neuropathy like golan barre syndromes, mononeuropathy. Then you can have polymyositis, dermatomyositis, periodic paralysis, corticosteroid or blocking agents, post-viral myositis, etc. There are good number of conditions. So, these are good number of conditions which can produce acute flaccid. Among systemic disease, acute intermittent porphyria, critical illness neuropathy, acute myopathy in ICU, myelopathy can be seen, muscular disorders like myasthenia gravis, botulism, tick bite, organophosphorus poisoning, etc. This all condition can produce. But some of this you see very common is Gulen Barre is one of the most common which you can see in your everyday practice. Botulism can be also one of the condition which you can see. Uh, I'll put another one as uh, even what we can call as poliomyelitis. Poliomyelitis, quite common. So that will be some of the common condition. So short form it is called AFP that is acute flaccid paralysis. So whenever you get, usually we proceed by two classical features, symmetrical or symmetrical. When you get bilateral symmetrical, lower motor neuron type of involvement, always suspect GBS. Second common transverse myelitis and third common botulism. And then acute cord compression. This will be very frequently seen in a traumatic injury. So this will be the four common conditions which you will have symmetrical. Severe traumatic injury to the spine can produce acute damage to the spinal cord. While asymmetrical classical in case of poliomyelitis, which will be acute onset, but asymmetrical, but peculiar, low motor neuron involvement, rapid wasting, fasciculations. Non-polio enterovirus can also produce asymmetrical. And pseudo paralysis will also produce asymmetrical. So, by and large, we, in asymmetrical, we put only one major group that is poliomyelitis and allied disorders. While in symmetrical, GBS, transverse myelitis, botulism, and acute cord compression, particularly traumatic injury. Now, among spastic, we already mentioned recovery phase of lower motor neuron, traumatic injury, it will be spastic variety in recovery stage and traumatic injury in a recovery stage. Latherism also, it will be always spastic. Cord compression, it will be always spastic. While flaccid will be in case of poliomyelitis, which will be asymmetrical. Motor neuron disease will be also asymmetrical. Golan Barre will be bilateral, symmetrical with minimal sensory involvement and sensory symptoms. Acute neurogenic shock, in case of a traumatic injury, also in acute stage, it will be flaccid. Later on, it will be spastic. Myopathy, always there will be proximal, will be more involved as compared to the distal. Polymyositis, it will be muscle involvement along with severe myalgia. You will have fever and your CPK level will be markedly elevated. Myoglobinuria. It will be bilateral, symmetrical. Good number of times, this will be some of the things you will see in your everyday practice. Hereditary spastic paraplegia will be again gradual onset, seen in family, seen in younger children. And good number of time, it is progressive. Placid variety, we have already mentioned some of the condition. Poliomyelitis, very common. Another common GBS or in case of a severe peripheral neuropathy. Among muscle, myasthenia gravis, proximal limb girdle myopathy. And don't forget psychogenic that is hysterical individual. 
Placid is very commonly seen in spinal shock, anterior horn cell disease, radiculopathy, peripheral neuropathy, and myopathy. Among compressive disorders, we can put in acute prolapse intervertebral disc, subdural abscess, hematomyelia, metastasis. Among chronic pot spine, prolapse intervertebral disc, tumor, spondylosis, arachnoiditis. And particularly in India, tubercular arachnoiditis is very, very common. So, good number of conditions can be compressive, maybe gradual. Very few conditions are acute, particularly subdural abscess, prolapse intervertebral disc, which can be a sudden damage to the spinal cord and can produce that and hematomyelia will be one of the conditions. So traumatic injury will produce acute while majority of other conditions will produce more common. It will be more common. Even fracture of fracture vertebra can also have acute compression. Compression you can further divide into intramedullary, extramedullary. Among extramedullary, meningioma, neurofibroma and arachnoiditis are very, very common. And again, these three are usually gradual. While syringomyelia, hematomyelia, hematomyelia can be acute. Syringomyelia is usually gradual. While inside the tumor, you can have gliomas also. That can be intramedullary. Most common will be syringomyelia and hematomyelia. Those will be the two most common conditions which you will see in your everyday practice. Syringomyelia will be gradual, commonly seen in early adulthood, most common in a cervical region, very frequently associated with scoliosis and you can have a quadruplegia and also person can have Horner syndrome associated with that. These are some of the condition in extradural. At your leisure time, you can go through intradural and intramedullary. Among intramedullary, do remember hematomyelia and syringomyelia. That will be intramedullary. Those two will be the most common. We already mentioned compressive, extradural, intradural. We have some of those conditions. Remember, intramedullary will be syringomyelia and hematomyelia. Quite common and very rarely gliomas. While extradural, most common, pot spine is very common, secondary metastasis, prolapse intervertebral disc, fracture vertebra, spondylosis, arachnoiditis, those groups. While intradural, you can put meningiomas, uh, neurofibroma, epidural abscess, those will be another group. This already we have mentioned, non-compressive myelopathy. All disorders which does not produce compression will be non-compressive myelopathy like familial spastic paraplegia, Frederick's ataxia, acute transverse myelitis, secondary due to autoimmune disease or infection, multiple sclerosis, motor neuron disease, subacute combined degeneration, lathyrism, vascular etiology which will be non-compressive, paraneoplastic disorders, all those will be non-compressive. You can divide those non-compression into acute and chronic. Among acute, inflammatory myelopathy, demyelinating disease, infective pathophysiology like viral, immune-mediated, post-infective or post-vaccination myelitis and vascular, that is acute occlusion of anterior spinal artery. Among chronic, multiple sclerosis, motor neuron disease, subacute combined degeneration, lathyrism, Frederick's ataxia, syringomyelia, syphilis, Tropical spastic paraplegia, hereditary spastic paraplegia, this will be non-compressive myelopathy. So if there is no suspicion of a compression, do try to look for this non-compressive group which you can divide into acute and chronic. Some example of pure motor, motor neuron disease, poliomyelitis, GBS, lathyrism. While pure sensory, classical example will be subacute combined degeneration. Motor plus sensory, majority of the groups which involves the spinal cord will be motor plus sensory. Good number of those conditions will be motor plus sensory like traumatic injury, transverse myelitis, vascular, cord compressions, intramedullary, extramedullary, 
all those conditions will be very frequently motor plus sensory together. So pure motor, motor neuron disease, hereditary spastic paraplegia, lathyrism will be classical example. Up spastic paraplegia, very rare. Syphilis, nowadays it is not commonly seen. In early compressive, it may be pure motor. Later on, it can be combined together. And good number of non-compressive pathophysiology. Among those, motor neuron disease, hereditary spastic and lathyrisms are pure motor variety. While motor pulse combined, subacute combined degeneration, AIDS myelopathy, and late stage of compression, you will have motor plus sensory together. Surface myelopathy is very rare when person is surfing because of hyperextension at the spinal level. You can have a traumatic back pain and paraparesis with sensory and urinary symptoms, quite common. Five common T's. Now here there is six trauma, transverse myelitis, tuberculosis, thrombosis, that is vascular, tumor and toxins. While here, someone has mentioned only five T's where toxin is not mentioned. So this will be the most common causes of paraplegia, all with T, trauma, tumor, tuberculosis, thrombosis, transverse myelitis. And don't forget toxins, particularly ticks toxin. Pathology, depending upon, I'll make it very simple. In acute damage, the spinal cord goes into a shock stage. All neurons goes into a shock stage. And in a shock stage, hypotonia, reflexes are absent, tone is reduced, power is zero, and even plantar will be absent in an acute involvement. Bladder and bowel involvement will be also there in case of a flaccid variety. As the person recovers, now there is an increased tone in the muscle. So person will have a spastic paraplegia where you will have hypotonia, reflexes will be pressed below the level of damage. You will be able to demonstrate particularly ankle clonus or patellar clonus depending upon the level of damage. Power will be, there will be some improvement in the power and person will have a typical spastic paraplegic gait or sometimes it is described as a scissors gait. Bladder will become automatic bladder because there will be increased tone in the bladder muscle and it will be an automatic bladder. This will be very peculiar in case of a spastic paraplegia. So these are the two common variety you will see in your everyday practice. Now, if we just go through a little highlights, in case of a partial damage, depending upon from where the damage starts, say if I take two or three examples, say person gets a damage in the central canal region like syringomyelia, which we put into intramedullary group, you will have a first involvement of two sensory tracts which are crossing at the level of spinal canal very close to the spinal canal, that is spinothalamic tract. So you will have a bilateral loss of pain and temperature, gone. So that will be the earliest thing which will be involved. And then depending upon the further progress, you will have involvement of the anterior horn cells. So you will have motor system involvement. And posteriorly, you can have a posterior column involvement. So that will be the way it will be in a syringomyelia. But say if there is a lateral compression, from one side, on that side, depending upon whether it is anterior or posterior. If it is anterior, early motor involvement, later on sensory involvement. And if it is posterior compression, it will be early posterior column involvement, sensory involvement, and then later on, you will have a motor involvement. So depending upon that, you will always have gradually progressive weakness. And when there is a complete cord compression, you will have below the level spastic paraplegia and total loss of all sensation. And at the level, you will have lower motor neuron type of a motor weakness with total loss of all sensation. And above the level, everything will be normal. So that will be the two things you have to 
look for in some of the congenital variety because of some congenital defects person will have increased motor tone we call spastic paraplegia which will label familial variety or congenital variety and in case of a frederick's ataxia you will have associated with increased spasticity in lower limb you will have cerebellar signs as far as traumatic and non traumatic is concerned very simple because of an trauma acute onset and in case of a non traumatic variety without the cause of trauma it can be acute it can be gradual because trauma will never be gradual so you have to remember the cut section of the spinal cord and how exactly the damage takes place at present i have not mentioned anything regarding the cerebral hemisphere in cerebral hemisphere we should remember that in a sagittal area para sagittal area there is on the medial surface of the cerebral cortex in parietal lobe region there is what we call as parietal lobe and frontal lobe that is in front of the central sulcus we have got a motor area and behind the central sulcus we have got a sensory area so whenever we get the damage in this para sagittal region that is either because of superior sagittal sinus thrombosis or maybe a unpaired anterior cerebral artery which has been thrombus or there is an hemorrhage or there is a para sagittal meningiomas or there is a traumatic injury in this region it will produce a damage to these two areas so we can have motor as well as sensor involvement and we can have involvement of both lower limb along with that you will have a bladder involvement also so you will have a paraplegia which will be by and large always spastic unless the person has got damage on one side more as compared to other side so you can have one limb more involved as compared to other limb but by and large it will be gradual onset so it will produce bilateral lower limb involvement which will be a spastic variety but as far as the vertebral column is concerned in vertebral column it can be acute it can be chronic it can be upper motor neuron it can be lower motor neuron at the level of damage lower motor neuron below the level of damage upper motor neuron damage but there are some condition which are pure lower motor neuron which will produce flaccid paraplegia and good number of condition will be producing damage to the corticospinal tract which will produce upper motor neuron variety and you have to be very careful regarding finding out the level of damage i am not going into detail regarding that in posterior column sacral fibers are medial most and chest fibers or we call cervical fibers are outer most or lateral most while as far as the pain and temperature is concerned that is spinothalamic sacral fiber are outer most so if there is an external compression from outside so sacral fiber will be first affected as far as pain and temperature is concerned and face face and cervical will be last to be involved so and if there is an intramedullary lesion then there will be always sacral sparing while in an extramedullary lesion you will have a first sacral involvement and then it will be involvement of the face and neck part of it neck and face part of it so that will be there as far as that is concerned same thing will be for that for motor system in a motor system sacral fiber will be first involved face and neck will be last to be involved as far as the anterior horn is concerned so this is a little peculiar presentation we should keep it in mind that is sacral fiber in a corticospinal also lateral most and face and neck are medial most while in case of a posterior column sacral fiber are medial most and head and neck are lateral most so this we have to keep it in mind so that we will be able to find out whether it is intramedullary or extramedullary compressions so i am not going into detail regarding a neurogenic bladder i have already uploaded one video lecture on neurogenic bladder 
so this is the most important slide as far as the spinal cord damage is concerned in cord compression compressive variety non compressive variety and in a compressive variety intramedullary extramedullary and in extramedullary extradural intradural those two groups so always remember this you will be able to pick up some of those conditions this is regarding a neurogenic bladder i am not going into detail one of the another very common injury very most common is at c1 c2 level second common injury at c4 c5 6 level and third common is at t11 and number 2 t11 to number 2 these are the three common sites where you get because of hyperflexion and extension injury at different levels so just remember those clinical feature majority of those are we have discussed acute and chronic we have already mentioned during acute injury whether traumatic vascular or infection or inflammation it will be always in initial stage flaccid and in some of the condition if it is an upper motor neuron damage in an acute it will be in a recovery stage it will be always spastic paraplegia well, in a gradual variety, particularly very commonly seen in the cord compressions and good number of other conditions can be also gradual, like lethargism, etc. All those will end up into spastic paraplegia. Very, very rarely lower motor neurons disorders, which are gradual, very few lower motor neuron disease are gradual, like motor neuron disease then uh, we can say not ideally poliomyelitis. So motor neuron disease, we can put one in a gradual and which will be uh, not spastic, but it will be more of flaccid because it is a lower motor neuron. So acute or by and large flaccid in a recovery stage, if it is an upper motor neuron, will be spastic, but gradual are usually spastic. Spastic you can divide into two groups in flexion and in extension. Usually partial damage are in flex in extension and in a late stage it will be always in flexion. Traumatic and non-traumatic can be partial or complete. And depending upon that, you will have which part is more damaged, which part is spared. You will have symptoms and signs in a complete damage below the level of damage you will have during acute stage completely flaccid in recovery stage spastic tone increase reflexes will be brisk clonus will be present bilateral plantar extensor bladder and bowel involvement will be automatic bladder or we call as spastic bladder at the level lower motor neuron tone zero power zero wasting fasciculation and reflex is absent that will be very typical in a complete lesion and in a chronic stage in a complete lesion and chronic stage but acute damage during acute stage below the level flaccid at the level flaccid Above the level, normal. I am not going into detail because of acute damage, because of hyper irritation, you can have little amount of hyperesthesia. But above the limit, sensory system, motor system, etc. will be absolutely normal. So that will be the way the presentation. Some conditions are pure motor, some conditions are mixed variety. I will give only one example of classical pure motor. Say as for example, gulen barre syndrome which will be pure motor, but it is acute and it is a lower motor neuron involvement. Being a lower motor neuron involvement, you will have hypotonia, tone zero, power zero, reflex is absent. Even plantar reflex will not be elicitable. Bladder and bowel involvement are not common, maybe there in an acute state, but it is not permanent involvement of a bladder and bowel. This will be very peculiar in case of a GBS. Sensory 
symptoms, signs may be present, may not be present. So, this will be the different ways and means of presentation. By and large, in a genetic variety, good number of time, they are all chronic, like familial spastic paraplegia, Frederick's ataxia, they are gradual. In Frederick's ataxia, along with spastic paraplegia, you will have a cerebellar signs. While among acquired, it can be acute, it can be gradual, it can be flaccid, it can be spastic, it can be pure motor, it can be mixed, it can be partial, complete, it can be traumatic, non-traumatic, it can be compressive, non-compressive, and again in compressive, it can be intramedullary, extramedullary, and among extramedullary, again, uh, intradural, extradural, etc. So those will be all different types of presentation. So during acute spinal shock, flaccid, absent or diminished tendon reflex, plantar reflex may not be elicitable and in a late stage spastic exaggerated reflexes, bilateral plantar extension. Straightforward. Classical spastic variety you can get in case of latherism and also in case of a recovery stage of acute paraplegia or acute upper motor neuron variety of paraplegia. Also in case of a gradual compression like cord compression and total compressions. We already mentioned flaccid, classical in case of GBS, poliomyelitis, motor neuron disease. But in motor neuron disease, you can have involvement of both upper motor neuron as well as lower motor neuron. You can have mixed picture. I already mentioned partial and complete. In partial, depends upon from where there is a damage, how much part of the spinal cord is being damaged, etc. So that will make the difference in case of partial and complete. In spinal shock, complete loss of muscle tone, bladder and bowel function is also lost, loss of sexual function also. So in a spinal shock, temporary suppression of all reflexes immediately after injury, intensity and duration vary with level of the damage and degree of injury and the reflexes etc. will recover soon from spinal shock. While in a neurogenic shock, it is mainly a distributive shock, mainly because of loss of sympathetic control. It occurs in the people who has got a spinal cord injury about T6 level, where 50% of the loss of sympathetic innervation is there. So in a neurogenic shock, it will be one variety we call as a distributive shock. And in that distributive shock, if there is a damage about T6, then you will have a neurogenic shock. Otherwise, good number of time we see only spinal shock. So always remember that. There are different phases in the spinal cord injury. 0 to 1 day are reflexia. In phase 2, from 1st to 3rd day, initial reflexes will return back because of super sensitivity third phase first week to fourth week now you will start regaining the tone hyperreflexia that is because of exon supported synapse growth and after one month to 12 months hyperreflexia and spasticity that will be the four phases what you will see in a recovery stage we'll have a two groups spastic and flaccid spastic can be in extension and flexion so differentiation between spastic and flaccid variety spastic is usually seen in late stage so muscle atrophy will be there very frequently in a late stage you don't see in an early stage and usually it is absent while in a flaccid variety if it is a low motor neuron, it will be always early and prominent. Muscle tone is always hypotonia and flaccid, increase in case of spastic. Motor power, total loss in flaccid, 
partial loss in spastic. Deep tendon reflex, brisk and clonus will be elicitable in case of spastic, while in case of flaccid, they are diminished or absent. Clonus is always possible in case of spastic, but never in case of flaccid. Plantar reflex will be always extensor in case of spastic, bilateral extensor, while here it will be usually flexor or maybe totally absent because of the complete loss of tone in those muscles. So this is an easy way to differentiate between the two. We already mentioned spastic paraplegia, increased muscle tone, there is a loss of inhibition of contraction, exaggerated deep tendon reflex, clonus will be there and plantar will be extensor. We will get two phases paraplegia and extension, paraplegia and flexion we will be showing you further. So paraplegia and extension occurs in the initial stage of the lesion because there is an increased tone in the extensor group of muscle because of partial transaction of the spinal cord due to involvement of pyramidal tract. So there is a hypertonia in extensor group of muscle but when there is a complete damage to both pyramidal x as extra pyramidal system, then there is more tone in flexor group of muscle because of progressive damage, complete transaction, extra pyramidal tract gets involved. Also, there is involvement of the pyramidal tract. Now, there is increased tone in flexor group of muscle resulting in a flex poser, flex posture in lower limb. Because in any person who comes to you with a paraplegia inflection, always consider complete transaction. So, inflection means pyramidal as well as extra pyramidal involvement and late stage. So, complete transaction, both pyramidal and extra pyramidal involved. Tone is increased in flexor group of muscle. And one important thing, mass reflex will be present. So, any stimulus below the lesion will produce flexor muscle spasm, bladder will get empty, bowel will also get empty and there will be seminal emission. Do remember this, mass reflex will be present only in case of late stage where there is an increased tone in flexor muscle. So that is very peculiar which will not be seen in paraplegia in extension. So do remember mass reflex is not seen and here it is mainly damage to partial damage to spinal cord, incomplete transection, mainly pyramidal tract is damaged, extra pyramidal tract is not involved and there is an increased tone in extensor group of muscle. So in extension, in flexion, again repeating that pyramidal, extra pyramidal, this is pure pyramidal. Hypertonia in extension, this is in flexure. The person position of lower limb will be extended, this will be flex. Deep reflex will be exaggerated in both. Clonus will be present more common in extension rather than in case of flexor because to demonstrate that those clonus will require to do extension. Mass reflex will be present in case of flexion which is a complete transaction damage. And bladder will be automatic bladder because you will be able to elicit mass reflex which will be there in case of a paraplegia where you will have a automatic bladder. We already done majority spastic we have done, flaccid we have already mentioned. So in flaccid power 0, tone 0, rapid wasting, fasciculation, reflexes will be absent, plantar reflex will not be elicitable, bladder and blow well will be flaccid, you will have a urinary retention. While in case of an upper motor neuron, hypertonia, power will be diminished, reflexes will be brisk, clonus will be present, bilateral plantar extensor and bowel will be showing you automatic bladder. And if there is a complete transaction, you will have a paraplegia, inflection and you will have a mass reflex. Almost we have finished upper motor neuron findings, spastic paraplegia, we have mentioned everything. Classical example of spastic paraplegia. Recovery state, traumatic, lathyrism, cord compression, late stage of cord compression.
we have already mentioned this flaccid variety also so i'll skip this particular slides so hypotonia power zero wasting fasciculation dip tendon reflex absent superficial reflex absent plantar reflex absent bladder and bowel will be hypotonic so there will be more of retention and sensory system may be affected may not be affected depending upon so classical example poliomyelitis where sensory may not be affected motor neuron disease again more of pure motor gulen bare again more of pure motor less of sensory acute neurogenic shock etc myopathy you will not have sensory involvement polymyositis also you will not have sensory involvement in those condition bladder and bowel will not be involved and even peripheral nerves are not involved almost we have finished majority of all those things in cerebral paraplegia it is spastic paraplegia lack of sensory involvement early bladder symptoms person will have invariably headache may have seizures person might develop mental retardation delayed milestones and altered sensorium may be present particularly if cerebral hemisphere is damaged so in cerebral paraplegia if you get any one of this finding it will go in favor of cerebral paraplegia so early bladder involvement headache seizures mental retardation delayed milestones altered level of consciousness will be very very common and if there is a weakness in upper limb also along with lower limb do suspect cerebr cerebral involvement we have already mentioned between compressive and non compressive groups just little further in compressive groups it is u shape onset means starting from one side going down and then again involving the other side from lower limb towards upper limb that is called elsberg curve so that is very typical in a compressive variety while in a non compressive variety usually bilateral symmetrical there will be upper level of sensory loss will be very clearly while usually in non compressive you will not be able to demonstrate the exact cut section level bony tenderness will be very commonly seen in a compressive variety deformity etc will be seen which will be not be present in case of a non compressive variety there will be always zone of hyperesthesia in case of a compressive which is not seen in a non compressive variety root pain is almost almost always present in case of a compressive variety which is rarely present in case of a non compressive variety or usually we say absent in case of a non compressive variety bladder and bowel involvement is very very early in case of a compressive variety while it is very very late in case of a non compressive variety so these are some of the common we have already mentioned compressive bony changes root pain sensory level and hyperesthesia most common while in a non compressive no bony changes no root pain no definite level and hyperesthesia is never present in case of a non compressive variety compressive is usually gradual non compressive can be acute compressive is usually starting as asymmetrical only and when there is a total compression then it becomes bilateral symmetrical while non compressive can be symmetrical bladder and bowel early while in case of non compressive it is late i am not going into detail regarding extramedullary and intramedullary only one part i already mentioned during intramedullary onset is usually is gradual spinal involvement is not there in case of intramedullary so spinal tenderness is less almost we say absent root pain is absent so sometime intramedullary lesion will be one of the variety of involvement of the spinal cord but it will be a non compressive type of involvement and sensory position that is posterior column involvement is usually spare pain and temperature is bilaterally lost very frequently in case of classical intramedullary lesions and sacral sparing is a classical thing in case of intramedullary lesion while 
sacral loss is very frequently seen in a case of extramedullary because there is a compression from outside while in intramedullary sacral sparing is the most common finding which you will see in case of an intramedullary bladder and bowel involvement is very early in intramedullary while in case of an extramedullary bladder and bowel involvement is late this is little bit on more detail we have already mentioned everything but still i'll go little faster in intramedullary radicular pain is less vertebral pain is almost absent while in extramedullary they are most common upper motor neuron findings will be late in case of intramedullary while in case of extramedullary it will be very early lower motor neuron findings in intramedullary is prominent and early because anterior horn cell involvement is early while in case of extramedullary it will depend upon the segment etc sensory involvement will be descending variety in intramedullary means starting from the face onwards to the lower limb and then while in case of extramedullary it is usually ascending variety sphincter involvement in intramedullary is early while in case of extramedullary it is late sacral sparing will be more common in case of intramedullary while sacral involvement is more common with extramedullary almost we have covered up majority of the things so just this is regarding which tracks are involved etc at your leisure time you can go through this already we have mentioned extramedullary intramedullary we have already mentioned and these are the etiology in extramedullary and these are the etiology in intramedullary in intramedullary two classical examples seringomyelia and hematomyelia while in extramedullary mainly meningioma neurofibroma arachnoiditis comes topmost and extra dural pot spine metastasis and intervertebral disc these are the most common causes i'll skip all this i'm not tackling regarding spinal cord damage that is cord hemisection complete transection central cord damage anterior cord damage cord equina etc i'm not taking we'll be having one separate full lecture on spinal cord injury or spinal cord disorders will be having one separate video lecture so this is spinal paraplegia already we have discussed majority of that and for identifying the sensory level you have to be aware of lower cervical add 1 upper thoracic add 2 lower thoracic add 3 at t10 level 1 lumbar 1 lumbar 2 t11 3 4 at t12 l5 and at l1 sacral and coccygeal segment this we should keep there is something called as a rule of 3 at the neck c3 axilla t3 knee l3 and perianal region s3 that is cervical 3 at the neck thoracic 3 axilla lumbar 3 at the knee and sacral 3 perianal region just roughly if you remember this may help you to just identify where, at what level and always remember upper cer lower cervical lower cervical add one thoracic upper thoracic add to lower thoracic that is 7 to 9 add 3 and then at t10 level number 1 to 11 3 4 at 12 5 at number 1 by and large cord equina sorry conus medullaris and then cord equina will start so that should be remember and this is which function will be affected right from c2 up to sacral that is cord equina level in sh short it is being mentioned if you are interested at your leisure time have a pause and you can go through so these are all those slides one by one i am keeping have a pause and just go through this is at the level of foramen magnum and upper cervical by and large it will end up into quadriplegia this is c5 c6 again chance of quadriplegia c8 t1 again upper limb will be involved some portion of upper limb will be involved 
So you will have upper limb as well as lower limb involved. C A T one. Something will be involved in upper limb. But as you come down below T one, now you will have a thorax and lower limb involved. So at your leisure time, you can go through what are the different. I will be uploading one video lecture on conus and cord equine and differences. This is a difference at your leisure time. Again, you can go through between conus and cord equina. All the differences very frequently will be asked, and these are all the questions regarding familial spastic paraplegia, Frederick's ataxia, multiple sclerosis, motor neuron disease, subacute combined degeneration, latherism. What are the findings you come across is mentioned in brief. I got all this from one of the very good lecture which was there on a upper motor array in YouTube. One of the doctor I had uploaded, so I felt this is will be very helpful to you in your oral exam as well as sometime in your theory exam for fourth year students. Spinal shock, anterior horn cell disease. peripheral neuropathy gbs etc latherism remember one boaa that is beta nox al nox alil amino l and n and that is the compound which is a neurotoxin and by parboiling you can remove this and this is by latherus sativus which is called kesari dal and that is being consumed by good number of people and that produces damage to neurons and that is giving rise to what we call as latherism spastic paraplegia so it is because of kesari dal that is latherus sativus because of toxin boa which is a neurotoxin and person will have a typical seizures gait and then person will be almost crawling conzo is one another variety which is also called as tied legs which is because of a toxins which is seen in cassava root which is cyanohydrin so just remember these two word cassava root and cyanohydrin and so person who are consuming this cassava root they are likely to develop a disorder called conzo and it is a tied legs so just out of way surface myelopathy i have already mentioned the person who are surfing on the water in a sea because of this typical posture we call unique syndrome can develop because of non traumatic damage to the spinal cord that will be paraparesis and non traumatic back pain you can have a myopathy which will be proximal muscle sensory loss is absent deep tendon reflex are preserved and classically you get in a muscular dystrophy polymyositis dermatomyositis and also you can come across in hypokalemic or hyperkalemic periodic paralysis autonomic nervous system i am not going into detail regarding a neurogenic bladder involvement so autonomic disref dysreflexia can occur along with the spinal cord damage and particularly if there is a damage at the t6 level so chances of autonomic dysreflexia will be always there at your leisure time you can go through it is a very very long topic you can have individual think you can discuss in detail so we have already mentioned upper motor neuron bladder involvement and lower motor neuron bladder involvement you can go through at leisure time i have already uploaded one video on a neurogenic bladder so at your leisure time upper motor neuron automatic bladder lower motor neuron placid bladder then we have already mentioned all these conditions in which conditions you will have pattern of weakness some of the symptoms say person comes with headache and seizures always we suspect cerebral etiology altered level of consciousness again cerebral 
so these are some of the things which will be helping you in your exams you can go through as far as investigation is concerned we will require two groups of investigation in suspected case with a cerebral damage ct brain while in case of a spinal you will require a plain x-ray ct or mri of spine so plain flame myelography ct with myelography or mri in case of an inflammatory disorder multiple sclerosis etc will might require a csf examination particularly in case of a gbs also csf examination will be helpful routine blood test etc depending upon what condition you are suspecting we already mentioned csf examination will be helpful in very few conditions mainly study of a spinal cord whether it is compressive non compressive what type of injury has taken place partial complete etc you can get idea from ct or mri so routine investigation with csf analysis particularly to rule out infective pathophysiology and in some of the conditions like multiple sclerosis and gbs it will be helpful ct brain will be helpful to rule out cerebral conditions so almost we have finished all those csf examination will be helpful to rule out freund syndrome particularly in case of what we call as spinal block freund syndrome will be very clearly demonstrable you will get low pressure xanthochromia clot formation on standing high protein content low cell content albuminocytological dissociation and you will be also demonstrating positive quick and state test depending upon the type of the damage partial or complete occlusion in a complete occlusion you will not be able to demonstrate quick and state test so this will be helpful almost we have covered up majority of the thing now conduction study will be helpful to differentiate now disorders peripheral neuropathy disorders like gbs chronic illness disorders or chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy you can differentiate by doing now conduction study from myopathy or neuromuscular disorders and emg will be helpful in those conditions to identify myopathy and myoneural junction disorders that will be very very important as far as the treatment part is concerned during acute phase or flaccid paraplegia care of bladder bowel skin nutrition bad sores prevention of dvt etc will be very very helpful in a cord compression decompression surgery as early as possible once the person gets into a spastic care of bladder and bowel is necessary treat the basic etiology if it is treatable in case of a compressive disorder decompression if it is possible as early as possible in acute transverse myelitis steroid may be helpful supportive line of treatment is absolutely necessary and person will need physiotherapy occupational therapy very very common so in general management care of bladder care of skin prevention of bad sores in bladder treatment for retention etc in a early stage and also in case of a urinary incontinence physiotherapy symptomatic treatment will be also useful specific treatment may be required in case of say tuberculosis pot spine akt anti tubercular treatment drainage of paraspinal abscess then decompression in any tumors metastasis etc rehabilitation regarding occupational therapy physiotherapy gait training etc will be very very helpful so prevention of provocative factors then team management medical or physical some of the drugs may be helpful in reducing the spasticity you can give intrathecal baclofen also you can use botulinum toxin 
or phenol blockade etc in general care nutritional care bladder care bowel skin prevention of bad sores prevention of deep vein thrombosis etc is absolutely necessary physiotherapy surgical intervention among complications particularly in flaccid variety polio gulen barre motor neuron disease person will have a wasting bladder and bowel involvement will be very commonly seen and you will have atrophy later on leading to wasting unequal limbs shortening of the limbs contractures etc may be seen in a spastic variety you will have a increased tone maybe in flexion maybe in extension bladder and bowel will be automatic variety dvt and pulmonary embolism will be very common bad sores contractures atrophy neurogenic bladder neurogenic bowel very frequently psychological disorders like depression recurrent uti lower respiratory tract infection cold feet many things so i end my lecture here i'm sorry it was a long lecture it will be very helpful to you in your everyday practice if you like this lecture don't forget to press button like subscribe and don't forget to press bell icon so that you get a message regarding a next uploaded video if you feel that this is helpful to your friend you can share with your friends also thank you very much for taking out time i know that your time is valuable and i appreciate you for spending some of the time with me see you in next lecture